There are some seats up front we can kind of fill in. Uh, these are no longer reserved for faculty. Welcome to the second presentation of the fall lecture series. Today's lecturers are David Levin and Stella Betts of Levin Betts Studio Architects. So following the lecture, please join us for a gallery uh, reception for their exhibition at the rear of the auditorium. I hope you all really look at this exhibit because it's important not only to examine the projects that they're presenting, but to look at the way they're presenting them. The installation itself is, is really something to behold. They didn't have very long to put this thing together. Part of that is my fault. Uh, but I'm really, you know, I'm impressed with what they were able to put together. I think it's a really interesting, uh, interesting body of work, and I hope you all look at it more closely. Um, <clears throat> let's see, they also had some stumbling blocks in terms of producing this exhibit, because they're very busy elsewhere. Um, Stella teaches at the Parsons School of Design. David teaches at the City College of New York. As you know, they're both visiting critics here at Syracuse this fall. They're also working on a monograph uh, with Princeton Architectural Press that's due out, I think it's about a year from now, next right. fall, something like that. So they're, you know, it's a couple of really busy people. Um, so I really want to welcome them today. Stella Betts received degrees from Connecticut College and the Harvard Graduate School of Design where she received her Master of Architecture. She also studied at the Boston School for the Museum of Fine Arts for a period. David Levin received degrees from Colgate University and the Yale School of Architecture where he received his Master of Architecture. He also spent some time at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York. They formed Levin Betts Studio Architects in 1997 in New York, and since then they've built an impressive portfolio of work. And yes, I did say built. The impressive part is that they've built so much uh, for such a young firm. Their designs have also been published in several of the uh, kind of one-word, buzzword mags, uh, including Dwell, Frame, Surface, Metropolis, and Oculus as well as some of the more established, you know, two-word journals, including interior design and architectural record. So, in terms of record, they also recently received a Design Vanguard Award that will be published in, I believe it's the December issue of record. As I mentioned, they're working on a monograph with Princeton Architectural Press, and I hope you'll keep the images they show you in mind, at least for the duration of this semester because I think they have some interesting things to say to a lot of the work that we'll be seeing for the remainder of the semester. Several lecturers come to mind in particular. Peter Eisenman, Weissenman Frady, Johnston Mark Lee. In some ways, the similar strands uh, represented in these different architects are similar enough to invite a kind of close comparison. So the differences then, the subtle differences, become that much more important. So, Please join us again over the rest of the semester for what I think is a pretty good lineup. So the work of Levin Betts Studio. I would position it somehow in a kind of territory between diagram and index. And I'll explain what I mean by that. It's diagrammatic in terms of its kind of formal restraint or reduction, to use Anne's favorite word. Um, in other words, it's just as important what is not present in their projects as what is present. So the work they've done in terms of editing, what they could have developed in their projects and chose not to, is equally important. Now, they have an interest in materiality, um, but I would say that it has less to do with kind of tectonic expression or conventional tectonic expression than it has to do with a kind of deployment of different materials to reinforce a diagram. Okay, so it's diagrammatic and the materials themselves work to reinforce this diagram. Light is one of their materials, not in the kind of conventional sense of the typical kind of natural light fetish that most of us architects share, but in terms of artificial lighting systems, they kind of deploy in different ways to create different surfaces. 
the work, so the, the work is diagrammatic. The work is also indexical. And by indexical, I, means, uh, I mean it desires to kind of register a process. Not conventional, once again, not conventional design process in a kind of Eisenminian sense, but a more, uh, somehow they seek to reveal um, latent organizational processes. And I think this has something to do with what they term pattern recognition, which is the title of their talk today. So I'm sure they'll talk more about that. One recurring indexical trope in their work is the cant, the slope, the shift, the kind of slight deviation from rectilinear. This, is, this operation is important because it signals a kind of shift in our formal expectations as occupants of their buildings. Sometimes it appears to mark the grid or remark on gridded space, but more often I would say <clears throat> These subtle shifts dislocate us from the gridded space or the grid entirely. They operate to provoke, um, and they provoke through a kind of subtle calling of our attention. Now, this, this subtle shifting or shifting uh, that operates as a kind of overlay might come from David's time at Yale, where these kinds of maneuvers were explored for their political or social agency might also come from Stella's time at the GSD where an entire generation, our generation, was entirely preoccupied, borderline obsessed with mapping things, with developing different strategies for mapping. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in, maybe the thing I'm most interested in, in terms of Levin Betts Studio's work, is this kind of collaborative process bringing together someone from Yale and someone from Harvard in a successful functional design relationship. So I hope they'll talk more about that. So please help me welcome David Levin and Stella Bates. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, we like to think that we're as functional as we can be, uh, given all of those parameters. Um, and um, we'd also like to thank Mark Robbins for inviting us to teach this uh, VC studio, um, and Randall Corman, uh, and everybody else here at the, the school who's made us feel so welcome uh, and well taken care of, which we truly feel. Um, so, the, um, the studio that we are teaching this semester is focusing, as many of you know, on the city of Albany and is concerned with the issues of urban place, or as we have uh, titled the studio, Topo City. Um, we are looking at various patterns in the city and region, um, and as in our work that we will show you in a moment, um, we define this idea of pattern widely. Um, as John uh, very interestingly uh, spoke to, um, and we think this, and we think of this product process as pattern recognition. Uh, this term comes from machine and computer learning, uh, and can have a slightly sinister sort of sci-fi connotation, uh, an idea of disembodied machines uh, taking on cognitive and decision-making uh, functions. Um, but for us, pattern recognition is a methodology for processing information surrounding an architectural problem. Uh, information is gathered and a procedure is devised for the interpretation and organization of this material into an architectural scheme. In this manner, the information becomes the architecture through an idiosyncratic, somewhat informal operation. Um, the resulting architecture recognizes the patterns that have been fed into the process of its making. In this sense, 
pattern recognition is inherently local, but globally applicable. Uh, the projects that we are presenting here today are, are classified by their embedded patterns. Um, these patterns that we will show again here, you, you've also seen on the boards um, out front, um, uh, they can come to the project from various sources inherent to the problem. Uh, these sources can be embedded in site patterns, forces, vectors, programmatic necessities, uh, and or conceptual conditions relating to the architecture. Our intention is to find and to create these patterns um, and through, a, through mapping, modeling, and drawing processes, retain the pattern in various formal and or conceptual conditions of the design. So this first image, um, you probably recognize from some of the uh, patterns from the exhibition itself. Um, these are just notations, really, of the simplified, uh, it's a simplified drawing of the embedded patterns within um, each project, of the projects that we're going to uh, speak about. Yes. Oh, I'm supposed to be using the microphone. So <laughs> is this now? Can you hear? Is that right? Um, so these are just the simplified sort of pattern uh, drawings of the uh, even closer um, of the of the projects that we're going to show. Was yours on? Can you hear me? I'll, we'll share the microphone. No, just just move it closer. Up the yes. Just talk a little bit. Um, this, this second set of images, which also you uh, may recognize from the, uh, the show, which we're calling our site locators. Um, and in, in many cases, although not all, uh, when we speak some more about the projects, this idea of, of pattern comes out of um, an analysis or an understanding of site. So for us, it really has a, a local code, actually, that's um, typically, again, not always um, uh, coming out of our understanding of site. So um, let me just begin with the projects. We're going to show 11 projects, um, both built and unbuilt uh, older projects and more recent projects. And then we're going to conclude with uh, two projects that we have in the studio right now that are um, in progress. Um, so quickly, uh, this first project is a Mixed Greens Gallery. Um, it's in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. It's a 3,500 uh, square foot gallery with two gallery spaces at the front and rear, an office area, storage area, a bar and lounge area, and some other support program. Um, the main thing about this project actually and the um, image on the right in the plan, um, when we first saw the space there was this very unusual beam and column configuration running right down the middle, which at first for us was something that we thought might be a problem trying to create a very sort of open gallery space. What we decided to do is to really let that be the generator of the form and that that pattern of the beam and, and column running through the middle of the space was actually going to set the, the pattern for the entire project. Um, so um, I'm going to now go to the next slide to talk about the main component, which is the ceiling, but I just also wanted to the point you to the uh, to the storefront itself, the, the gallery is on the second floor, and we also are going to talk a little bit about our use of color in this gallery, and then also um, some custom uh, pieces. But getting back to the project itself and how it started, the images on the right was the existing space with this beam and column configuration, and basically also because it was a gallery and the ceiling was the one sort of surface that we felt like we had an opportunity to do some design, we needed to keep the rest of the space quite simple for different. Um, uh, art to be displayed. So for us it was the ceiling and we really um, created the ceiling that really reverberated this, this uh, pattern. The ceiling itself is made out of um, a mill finish aluminum flat bar with these acrylic panels um, in between. And one of the other things that then would we decided that the ceiling was sort of our surface, it really it had embedded all the infrastructure of the space itself. So the HVAC system, which is the slots for the return, the supply and return, the sprinkler system, of course the spot lighting for the gallery itself, and then the overall um, illumination of the middle components of the gallery, which were the office and the storage area, and then um, the front and end of the two gallery spaces. This is an image from the rear gallery. This ceiling, and I'll show a reflected ceiling plan in a few minutes, um, th there, there was an extension of some uh, the custom lights that we designed as well that went over these um, significant kind of furniture components. Uh, that, that extended into the gallery spaces. 
So to talk a little bit more about the ceiling itself, which again was sort of our main design intervention, um, the image on the far right, you can see the construction image. Um, we basically, it was a drop ceiling with the, all the infrastructure and the mechanicals. Um, and then just very simply uh, fluorescent lights um, end to end, and then this aluminum flat bar structure that allowed for these removable um, acrylic panels. Um, you can see the reflected ceiling plan in the lower image, and then the extension of these um, custom lights that went um, extended into the gallery space for additional spotlighting. We call these tail lights. Um, so then the other pieces went over the uh, the uh, areas where we had uh, the reception desk, the bar area, and and the furniture. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to go back? Just one, go back one sec. The, you can begin to see this pattern that we've been referring to and we've pasted onto the boards out in the gallery, uh, emerging in the reflected ceiling plan of the, uh, of the space. And as, this, as Stella has talked about, this infrastructural ceiling being so important, uh, that was truly the, the surface uh, of our, the main surface of our intervention. So one of the other components that I was referring to with the, in the original facade image with the green is the use of color. Um, the gallery itself is called mixed green, so it was pretty uh, obvious to us what color we would be accenting with. Um, we basically took all the spaces that we felt we could add color, the interior of the office, the interior of the storage area, bathroom space, interior of all the cabinets, and we basically took this kind of uh, egg yolk idea where the interiors of all of this we were able to sort of use a mix of green um, to sort of pop the color and then as we'll show you in some of the other images when they did have openings um, a lot of times then this these areas would be closed off and then the space would become all white again so these were the sort of diagrams on the right uh, that show the idea and the way that we were conceiving of the space and again some other image of the interior on the left of the office area and then the uh, the bathroom and then again, this is of the bar area um, for during uh, art openings and inside all the cabinetry, this sort of mix of different green color. Um, there are also, we had these very large um, sort of sliding walls, there's kind of like barn doors and we, they were also made out of this luminous uh, acrylic and then even the door handles were of a similar um, form and material of the ceiling, which is this mill finished aluminum flat bar that's slotted into the walls themselves. And then finally, um, there were three pieces of furniture, the reception desk, the bar, which I showed um, before with the cabinet behind, and then this particular piece, which was a pivoting uh, media table. Um, this particular gallery has basically their artwork on a website as well that you can browse. So the idea was that there were these laptops on a given sort of day where someone would be visiting the gallery. They could browse the collection, but at other openings or certain installations by uh, artists, they were able to sort of pivot the table out of the way. Okay, so I'm gonna go through two older projects a little bit quicker. Um, this one is a printing plant, also in the Chelsea area of, uh, of Manhattan. And the challenge or the interest to us what really kind of drove the project was kind of twofold. Um, one, it was a, a two-story printing plant on the street level and the floor below. Um, for a series of logistical purposes, the press rooms were all gonna be on the street level and then most of the people working in the publishing and desktop publishing and production all had to be down into the basement. So we had two things. We had to really organize the relationship of departments because it was very critical in terms of they would work on something desktop publishing, it would go to a film output, and there was a, a process of connection through departments. But we had to make sure that we were bringing in light into the basement space. There was a limited budget, and they didn't want to give up too much square footage. And then the final thing was is that the equipment itself to run all the press rooms and all the equipment for the publishing had a a long list of requirements, mechanical requirements for heating and cooling and humidifying and electrical. So basically the project came out of trying to create a circuit diagram for all the equipment and a circulation diagram for all the people in the department. So basically we organized the whole process around that, created this sort of central spine where there was an interaction and made a five foot by 75 foot cut in the floor plate to allow light down into the space. Um, so here you can see on the left the image in this sort of circuit zone um, and there was bridges that connected the two uh, departments and on the right the two floors um, with this sort of wiring diagram and, and a relationship of departments 
and their adjacencies that were required. And again, another image of this sort of circulation zone. Very simple um, from a sort of budget standpoint. Again, the use of sort of fluorescent lights. These are polycarbonate walls. The idea was when you were in the sort of central zone, it was a kind of brighter light. And then the images on, on the right are on the opposite side of that wall. So you get this kind of glowing wall. All the equipment gets plugged into that wall. So it turns into the central wiring diagram. Um, and then, so the image on the upper right is upstairs in one of the, uh, uh, the film output, which is pre-press. Um, and then the image on the lower right is down in the basement. And the idea was to sort of bring light and orientation down to that space. Um, and again, another sort of diagram with that, with the stair going down to the lower level. Um, an image under the stair, obviously. And then downstairs, again, a sort of conference room and lunch area for the employees. And again, this luminous wall kind of went all the way through. So it did connect, which actually this diagram here shows so that you did, when you were at the base of the stairs, very deep down into the basement, you could have a connection back to see the street. So the idea of kind of knowing what the weather was like outside. But also this kind of luminous ceiling that gave you some orientation to where you were, even in relation to the city. Um, another project, uh, this is a lobby for a residential building in Lower Manhattan on Nassau Street. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Nassau Street, but it's an all pedestrian street, unusual in Manhattan, um, but mostly commercial. Um, and this was a lobby for a residential building. So um, in a very sort of basic, simple way, what we, what we felt we needed to do is to invert the relationship of the commercial storefront and create some sort of privacy or frame to view for a residential entrance so it was distinct. And at the same time, of course, we wanted to maintain a relationship to the street in the city. So we started with these framed sort of sliced views that we thought of as where you were going along the street itself and then kind of folded in the idea of framed views and patterns of use into the lobby itself. So this was actually, this is a view of the facade. So we did frosted glass, it was a low iron glass, it was a whiter glass and not quite so green, although this photo looks more green. Um, and then the area of, of transparency kind of framing the views in as well as the views out. Um, and then the program inside the lobby and the way that we kind of set up the pattern in this case um, was this pattern of use. So kind of checking your mail, going through the vestibule, then passing by the security. There was a bench there for waiting um, or going to the, through the um, waiting for the elevator. We kind of created a, a, a pattern of use through time that kind of gave us a, a way of uh, creating a, a pattern and breaks in the material itself, both on the walls and in the ceiling. Um, and then these cuts and these patterns of use had to do with whether you're standing or walking or sitting. So then we created these slices, um, both in the wall, and I'll talk about the, what the wall's made of, and also so these kind of voids and these cutouts, as well as these like solid volumes, which is the canopy itself, which you saw kind of it pierces through the um, vestibule and out to the street, the uh, desk uh, for the security, and then there's a bench in the back that these images don't show. But the main wall, which is this glass wall that is mirrored, and then um, offset from that these clips with, uh, again, this low iron frosted glass. And what it did was kind of create this fuzzy reflection throughout the wall, and then a very, obviously, a distinct in the areas where we left exposed. Again, and that had to do with the relationship of where you were walking or sitting on a bench. And, and in these images, you can see the, uh, the detail of the clip, the way um, we clip this entire wall to this mirrored surface. And what's important for us here is this idea that the, the pattern that we began to uh, recognize uh, of usage and, and movement through the space, uh, in the end, comes down to the level of detail. Um, and as John uh, mentioned, building is very important to us. Um, so the way that the detail uh, comes out and is part of this, uh, this discussion of pattern uh, is, is very important to us. These are simply stainless steel clips with um, sort of uh, thumb screws tapped into them and then coated with um, uh, little lengths of surgical tubing to, to cushion the glass uh, if it moved with the change in pressure in, in the space. Uh, this project is um, located in Chicago um, across the Kennedy Expressway. And it was a winning uh, entry for a competition held by the uh, Architecture Club of Chicago in 2003. Um, 
the program was uh, for a thousand car parking facility with various other um, programs attached to it uh, in terms of tourist information bureaus um, and then we uh, and we added a few other programs to it ourselves um, the pattern that we were interested in here and we'll, I'll show this in uh, some later slides um, comes from the the morphology of the highway the the lanes the off-ramps uh, that were created in the in, in and around the 19, 1950s when the Kennedy Expressway and many other highways in the country were were made. We were very interested in this sort of subtle, you know, peeling off of a roadway from another one. Um, the site is also very important in this project. Um, the site for the competition was uh, to the right side of the uh, image, and uh, we chose to uh, span across uh, the highway uh, to sort of diverge from the, the confines of the site. Um, and a couple of other things that were very important to us in this was uh, that we wanted to create a parking garage that challenges the conventions of program um, and dimension as well. Uh, te technology plays into that and I'll speak about that in a moment. Uh, as well as the material of parking garages which are often very concrete intensive. Um, we were also very interested in creating a garage that reveals the schedule of its usage um, so that one could see uh, how full it was from the highway when driving by. Um, and um, one that also uh, connects uh, the existing uh, inf infrastructure and commuting systems to the downtown. Uh, the Kennedy Expressway cut off the western part of the city um, that was perhaps not terribly formulated at the time from the downtown. Um, we, we also um, placed, as I said, we placed the, the bridge over the highway to create this bridge uh, that, that allowed for a pedestrian crossing to make this connection. Um, yeah, um, in this image this shows the site uh, that we, we chose bridging across these patterns beginning to emerge of the Kennedy Expressway. Uh, then on the, on the uh, right side you can see in the, the expressway is on the left and which is here. Uh, the approach into the garage is in here uh, and then the facility is all along uh, the, the roadway. Um, uh, as far as technology goes, the way we were able to achieve this, in, this kind of incredible thinness for this garage was by adopting um, an automated parking technology. Um, there are various systems out there. They're uh, not uh, terribly used that much in the United States. Um, we were very interested in using this. So we had done some earlier schemes using conventional ramping systems. and. We, through research, we found this and we thought it was uh, uh, extremely useful for this, this uh, ability to challenge convention and also uh, for general ideas of, uh, general sustainable ideas in terms of reducing car idling and uh, fuel usage. Another key component to this garage, which I'll show you in further slides, uh, is the use of air filtering plants uh, in and around and on top of the building. Uh, we did a series of studies of trees that held up well in urban environments um, and uh, all, were also useful for filtering um, carbon monoxide. Um, one little tidbit that we came up with was that in one year, a single tree can absorb as much carbon dioxide as produced by a car driven 26,000 miles. So we used several trees. Uh, this is an image of the approach uh, of parking cars into the facility. Um, again, these patterns show up as these ramping berms. Uh, the berms were then utilized for planting areas, seating areas, biking and pedestrian access uh, up into the facility. Um, and you can begin to see the, uh, the sort of pattern of usage on the facade of the, of the building. Some cars are, are located inside here. Yeah. Then right up at the plaza level, this is the this is sort of the main entry up above car parking. So this, once you leave the, the street and ramp up, you're in sort of pure bike and pedestrian air, uh, realm. Uh, as you go into that plaza, which is underneath the cars, you can make a left and travel across the Kennedy Expressway um, on these uh, long sort of uh, strip walk and bikeways. Uh, this exploded image just uh, explains all the various systems at work from planting to program, skin structure, and then the berm structure. 
this, these uh, series of diagrams refers to uh, this idea of usage and the building as a sign. Uh, these diagrams are at various times of the day, um, the middle of the night when there are very few cars, to uh, during the day when the garage is largely full. Um, this image uh, cuts through the building and explains all the different systems at work in section. Uh, you can see the, uh, the red diagrams show the movement of automobiles as they drive in, get spun around on a turntable and taken up into uh, the machine. Uh, the plaza on top of that for pedestrians uh, hanging in that space, actually a point is the uh, Tourist Information Bureau, um, and then various plantings through the building to the rooftop cafe and sort of strip grassland at the top, and then uh, bike rental and storage uh, in this area as well. These, these two images are just taken um, what would be right inside the parking structure itself. So the image on the left inside the automated parking zone, um, we utilized the cross bracing for the structure and created, in, in the cross bracing, created planters for hanging trees. So we had this sort of hanging tree garden because below is where is the pedestrian and the bike path that crosses over the bridge. So if you're going over the bike path or the, uh, or the pedestrian path, which you see in the image on the right, the two zones. We had one for bikes and one for pedestrians. You would look up and you would be underneath this uh, uh, tree garden in the cross bracing. And then the image on the right, again, is basically a view that we imagined if you were driving a convertible in Chicago as you're driving underneath this when you would look at what you would see. Um, this next project is uh, it's a theoretical urban design proposal for the greater uh, region of Jerusalem, Ramallah, and Bethlehem. Um, and it was published in a book um, entitled The Next Jerusalem that was edited by Michael Sorkin. Um, we were invited with a friend of ours uh, who had actually lived in Jerusalem for a while to, to do this project uh, for the book. Uh, this is many years ago uh, at the moment when uh, it was expected that peace was going to break out uh, in the region. Um, unfortunately, other other things have occurred. Um, however, our project uh, entitled Spaces Between the Hills or Neutral Density um, to connote one, the, the zone, uh, not land, that is contested, uh, where we thought that one could build, uh, as well as neutral in terms of um, neutral. neutral. <laughs> um, uh, so so um, we were uh, tourists, essentially, to this region. Um, we're not from there. We didn't know it very well. Um, so in order to better understand the place, um, we approach the site uh, in, or the, the, the larger site of the, the uh, city or the region in two specific ways. One was the physical and the other was embedded temporal patterns of the area. Uh, the, in, in terms of the physical, the study, a study of the topography um, revealed that the valley systems in this area, which you can see in the, the large dark shapes, um, uh, configured the areas of development, uh, essentially, and you know, the hill structures that all of the neighborhoods, uh, or most of the neighborhoods, tried to take advantage of. Um, we also studied road systems, settlement patterns, uh, and other sort of natural uh, green systems. Um, uh, and then back to the temporal, uh, we uh, studied uh, prayer cycles of the three uh, primary religions in the area. Uh, and understood how they affected sort of daily patterns uh, in terms of programmatic elements, and we'll get to this in a moment, that we, uh, that we were <coughs> looking at in this area. Okay. Um, so the, uh, this, the, these three sites that negotiated the valleys in distinct ways, um, the first one was the, uh, the recreational center. We, we thought of it as a seesawing burned, uh, I'm sorry, seesawing ramped park system. Uh, which you can see here, these are the sort of ramping forms that I'll show in a later slide. And then up at the top are these sort of different cycles of recreation and then the prayer cycles of the different faiths. Uh, these are images of that uh, sort of large park system, how they relate to some of the patterns of settlement, topography, uh, and other factors of circulation and green within the system itself. Uh, and you can see the sort of forms of this, these large park structures. The tennis center in Jerusalem is 
right around here. So there was this sort of recreational, this embedded recreational program that we were very interested in. Uh, the second site was the uh, was a, a sort of necklace, a beaded necklace site that also had a, bu a bureaucratic program, uh, and we chose this program because it was south of the old city, which you can see in this sort of density in here. Um, again, the uh, cycles of the bureaucratic elements and the prayer cycles sort of intersecting through that area. You can see the uh, the different buildings strung out along the. The, the necklace. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Okay, I'll use it. Can you hear me now? Oh, wow. Hello. Um, so the uh, the buildings are, are strung out and beaded along these uh, uh, different types of, uh, of, of strands of different programs of, of transportation, essentially. Um, Roadways, bikeways, pedestrian paths, and uh, our proposed light rail in the uh, holy city. Um, then uh, the, the the last site was um, a transportation hub that we called. Uh, it was a, a large urban staple that was again spanning between two distinct neighborhoods uh, and utilizing various uh, transportation systems in its organization. Uh, these, uh, these images are of the building, showing the various systems at work, uh, and, and also the different uh, circulation systems piercing through the building. Um, this project is um, it's a, a, a housing project. In, uh, it's for a 44-unit housing project designed for a site in Cedarhurst, Long Island. Uh, we're sort of in developmental stages at the moment. Um, the community is uh, middle income, but the site was designed uh, for middle to lower housing at the end of this town's main commercial street. Um, the site plan was, uh, was impacted by uh, required unit numbers and parking spaces, which drives design a lot, um, as well as its corner condition at the intersection of the main road and side street leading to a large golf course uh, and to, that had an inlet to the Long Island Sound. Um, the combination of various usages and paths of movement created a spiral uh, of cars going down um, and uh, then con configured the uh, this sort of form of the building itself, uh, sort of going through the, uh, the organization of units up to a common pool, which you can see here, and I'll show you that in future si slides uh, in this diagram showing the different spiraling and then going up to this common shared space. Um, uh, as efficiency of space and budget was a major factor in the project, uh, a skip-stop duplex unit organization was employed. Uh, this mes method reduced hallway space, provided for more complex unit types, and helped to allocate limited funds to this common pool and gym area uh, on top of the building. Uh, the presence of green in the project operated at three conditions um, that we will show you. Um, there is the unit and private green, the courtyard and common green, you can see this in the middle diagram at the top, uh, and the public green spiraling around the building. Uh, and um, each unit has this potential for a, a green space in a balcony that's either, uh, that's either facing the courtyard or the outside of the building, depending on where it's located. Uh, in these uh, series of drawings, you can see the, uh, the plan organization uh, particularly the skip-stop organization that eliminates the, the, the need for a hallway uh, in this entire floor plate, uh, spiraling down to the parking and then green in the middle, uh, and then these units at the ground, uh, which were largely commercial uh, around this green space. Um, again, showing the spiraling diagrams up here. Uh, and then these uh, drawings, which I think are a little bit difficult to see, are um, explaining how the, uh, the various types of units were configured in terms of their infrastructure uh, and cir internal circulation, which obviously a duplex unit requires. As well as a storm. And these uh, diagrams further explain uh, the uh, hallway organizations. You can see the circulation in the red lines moving through the building. And then the various unit types, uh, as well as uh, the red arrows, explain which units are duplex. Uh, and which are, are single, single story. 
uh, and then some, some views from the street showing these large openings where that provided for balcony and green spaces. Uh, this image at the top is this, uh, this common space, which is the pool and exercise area. Uh, below the, uh, and below that is the access into the parking garage. Section through the building showing the pool and common area, as well as units. And again, a section through the courtyard showing the, uh, the units that can open on to uh, the courtyard area. These units didn't have a face onto the common street area, so they were able to open up onto the courtyard for a green space. And then views from inside that courtyard. Uh, this next project was a, a competition entry for um, a library in Stockholm, Sweden. Actually, it was an addition to the Eric Gunnar Asplund uh, Library that was completed in 1927. Um, and essentially, the addition was about two and a half times as large as the original library, and most of the collection uh, was going to be moving into the, the new library. Um, for us, again, this idea of sort of pattern and where, where to begin um, was kind of started, of course, with the Asplund Library, and we were interested in the sort of central void of the library, the central rotunda um, that all the reading rooms and the books and everything are organized around. Um, so that was the main thing that drove the project. And then um, the other sort of secondary components was the, the access to the street and creating a, a street entry and then making a connection also to the park behind um, with the observatory that was part of a larger campus. So this, uh, there was quite a, as you can see in this image, a <coughs> topographic um, change in the site. Um, but again, going back to the thing that sort of drove the project, this idea of the void of the, uh, of the Asplund Library. So we took a larger step back and looked at um, the sort of patterns within the city itself and looking at these uh, court housing courtyard uh, buildings and looking at patterns of solid void within the sort of context of the site itself, which are the images on the left. And then the image on the right, a kind of dumbed down version of the project where it was literally just the Asplund, the square with the round circle in it, and then our proposed addition that I'll talk about what we also created, these similar voids that were our kind of interpretation of that. Also playing on this idea of uh, creating a void with books and collection around it. Um, so here, the proposed plan for us, uh, basically we there were nine uh, departments, and then, and then in addition to the, the one department that was going to stay in the Asplund Library. So we basically gave a skylight, a void, uh, to each department, and then organized the books and the collection around that void. Um, we created these skylights. We gave them a color of yellow. Um, the rest of the, you'll see in some of the other images, the, the palette of the building, as we proposed, it was quite neutral. Um, and we wanted these kind of yellow glowing skylights that went straight through the building which you see here in section because of the sort of topographic change we wanted we basically wanted to um, elevate the library and create an entry from the street up and an entry from the park down and so the library was kind of sandwiched between these two entries and the skylights pierced through the building and they were the one sort of connection um, the other thing which I'll show uh, in the, in the idea of the skylights is we kind of elongated them, and this had to do with um, Sweden being a northern climate and trying to actually grab as much light, so even in the winter when the sun is very low, that there would be light that would be going through these skylights and actually create a pattern on the plaza level below. Um, so here's some uh, renderings of the sort of uh, street level of the, uh, of the library. Um, this is side that would c connect to the Aspen Library. I'm going to talk a little bit about the skylight some more. Um, so we started off with this idea of the, the void and the skylight and wanting to have the collection around it, but we also felt like that we, that wasn't enough. So we decided that the skylights actually had to do more work, and we uh, organized the entire kind of mechanical um, system, the heating and cooling, as well as the sort of light that came down to the plaza, and really got these skylights to start working for us. So truly, they're, they're a double-walled system where the heat and cooling um, goes in and through these skylights with operable windows. So they're really the, the supply and return for the mechanical system. And then again, the sort of diagrams on the lower right showing um, what created the kind of elongated form. We really stretched out Asplund's void in order to grab uh, 
to grab the sun. And then the image on the lower, uh, the lower left, again, just being sort of isolated, each department getting, um, getting a skylight for the collection of reading rooms and books to be um, uh, surrounded by. So here again, a, a, more, a rendered section. Um, the other component, which there was sort of a lot of things to kind of juggle, there was a, um, a subway that was, an existing subway station that was going underneath and then they wanted, part of the proposal was to make a connection to that. So this cut is actually taken not where the lobby or the, the entry to the subway, but you can see the connection. So again, we had this idea of going from above at the park, dropping down, going from the street level, going up, but then wanting to create a connection down to the subway level as well. So one of the skylights is in the floor at the um, park level above and then kind of drops down like a stalactite, right? A stalactite or stalagmite. So like a stalactite um, that would drop down into the, uh, the subway area. Uh, again, some very quick diagrams on the left, really diagrams of program. There were other requirements that are, you know, we won't get into, but in terms of 24-hour spaces and the collection itself. So the light yellow, you can see these were the public areas, the 24-hour areas, and then certain aspects of the library. We, we wanted you to use this as an urban pathway as well. There were two egress stairs that we actually celebrated as the stairs that weren't kind of buried in the library, and one being completely outdoors so that even when the library was closed, you would have this connection from the park above and the plaza below. The upper right uh, was a structural diagram that basically, um, they're not true Barrendale trusses because they're interpreted in terms of they're slanted, but we had our engineer, we were working with him on that, and basically they're organized around these nine uh, department divisions and they're two, two story uh, trusses. And then the lower, uh, the image on the lower right, just the book circulation diagram in terms of how you would return books. Uh, you know, we had at the plaza level and at the, park roof level above, which will show you there were book drop-offs when, when the library was closed. So here, another image of the building with these uh, nine glowing uh, yellow skylights. And then an image of the roof, which also we kind of brought this idea of the park up and onto the roof, so there would be areas of uh, reading and uh, planted uh, roof garden that was part of this other public space that was, that was above. <coughs> And then the last view, just uh, at the upper entry, uh, what that would be like an interior view of the skylight. Okay, we're, we're gonna go to New York on uh, along the Hudson. Uh, two houses that we've completed in the last couple of years. Uh, this first house is on the west side of the Hudson in the Catskills. Um, and this, this project really, um, really was driven out of um, our experience of the site itself. It's a very wooded site. It has a large drop-off you can see in this image. Um, and when we would go there and walk the land, it was always about there's a stream at the bottom. We were always trying to figure out how to get down to the stream. Um, we knew that uh, the people that were going to be uh, living in this house, it was they were coming from New York, and we figured well, they're going to want to get there, get out of their car, and go down to the water. So the idea really was is like how do you how do you negotiate this landscape, this sort of steep drop off in a way that the house could facilitate that. So we literally just conceived of the house as a series of landings or steps in the landscape. Um, so again, the, these images here in terms of the sort of what set up the sort of pattern and the organization of the house. Um, the image on the left being this idea of taking sort of photos, creating landings or steps, and and really picking an area close to the steepest area of the. Uh, of the site and creating these these steps, and we were when we had initially sort of looked at the project, um, we were kind of thinking about you know when we were timing ourselves and how we like slow down at certain points um, when we hit the steeper part of the project. So we were kind of making a relationship of um, longer landings in relation to steeper areas so that you actually could get down to the water faster. Um, the plan really pretty relatively straightforward to full bedrooms with another bedroom that's sort of like a study bedroom. Um, the idea of the project was really to open it up to the landscape. We just created like a central storage uh, spine that really organized the, uh, the layout of the house. The, the downstairs was really quite open, which you'll see in some of the images, and the upstairs, we used this storage cabinet as a way to sort of create a hallway on one side and bedrooms on the other. But the storage cabinet was utilized on both sides, so sometimes it was storage in the hallway side and sometimes storage on the bedroom side. 
And again, always creating access and a connection to the outdoor landscape, which is what the idea of the sort of perspective collage on the right, sort of seeing the landings and then just always trying to have the house have views out. So here's the, the house itself at the entry view, which is on the north side, fewer windows. Um, uh, you can see the stepped landings going down into the entry of the house, and then the house itself, the, you know, the upper half being slid off of the lower half, creating this sort of stepping down, which also created two things. It gave us a carport, and then on the upper left-hand zone, uh, created the uh, master uh, bedroom terrace. All three, uh, uh, Bedrooms had its own private, um, its own private deck. Not private, actually, because you could get access to it. But at least it's on deck. <laughs> the material of the house itself on the out, the lower level is the um, is wrapped in a cement board uh, panel siding, and the upper part of the house is a, a cedar siding. And I'm just gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the roof, but I'm just gonna draw your attention to the scupper um, because. Uh, where the house, it's, the roof is sort of an inverted uh, hip roof. And uh, what you can see, this is the one elevation of the house where the, the roof has a profile. Everywhere else, it's, it, it's, it looks as though it's a flat roof. Uh, this is the image on the south. So here again, then you see that it does, the roof looks flat. And you can see the stairs going from the deck down to, uh, to the street. Uh, this is another view off which would the, the deck that you see there is off of one of the uh, bedrooms, the sort of guest bedroom. Um, again, this is the uh, south side. With You can also see the other opening is for the other uh, den, the deck off of that den. Um, these are a couple of construction photos that uh, uh, where you can understand how some of the moves were, were made and some of the details that we were interested in. Uh, achieving so that there was this legibility of the upper volume slipping off of the lower volume. Uh, so they, they occur in, in structure and in detail. Um, these are uh, just images of the, uh, the steel framing on the concrete piers that allowed us to have that, this carport uh, and this idea of shifting of the building. Um, these are the images uh, of the, the framing of the roof that Stella was referring to. Uh, the sort of half a hip roof that drained to a scupper um, required uh, some uh, large valley rafters that went all the way across the building. Um, and then these images on top of the roof uh, that looks like a really fun sca skateboard ramp um, shows that the, how the, uh, the roof uh, changed shape and plan uh, as well as maintaining uh, level um, sill plates um, on three sides and then the contoured one on the, the north side where the drainage occurred. Oh yeah. Um, and then the finished uh, house where um, on the left uh, the building sits up on its piers uh, seemingly precariously. Uh, but then on the right uh, the details that we were trying to achieve was this was uh, had to do with the siding on top looking very very thin as if it was sort of peeling across uh, the lower volume. So these details were very important to us. I'll just go through the interiors quickly in terms of this is obviously images of the, of the first floor. And again, trying to create this idea of um, looking in and through the house. Um, not only the, the idea of the sort of path through it, but at most points in the house and certainly the point of entry that you're, uh, you're looking through to the landscape. Uh, this is the area of the kitchen, which is the back side of the views that we just showed. The image on the lower right is the entry door, and these are the, uh, the storage cabinets that occurred on the lower level. And then here on the upper level, uh, again, these, this sort of strip of uh, storage closets that divided the bedrooms from the, uh, from the hallway. And then on either side of the hallway, a door that went out to the, uh, to the deck that really framed the views of the, uh, the trees. Um, I'll just have you kind of note again this idea of the roof. You can see the, the fold in the roof here and here of these uh, valley rafters in terms of this kind of inverted uh, roof uh, that we created. It was that profile of that roof is legible, obviously, on the inside of the house, and we held the cabinets uh, just a little bit low. And then the image on the, uh, on the right was for the master bedroom and that deck and then the, uh, the master bathroom. And then finally, the, the flip side being out on the deck of the master 
bedroom and looking back down that corridor in the bedroom itself. And again, and we ha we obviously the, the we had to clear some trees um, when we built this project, but we did try to keep certain ones that were as close to the house as we and the client felt comfortable. And really, actually, a lot of the house siding had to do with framing the views of these trees that you see at the end of this hallway. These uh, tree trunks. The house is very much feels like a tree house um, when you're in it. Yeah. Yeah, there's one tree at this end and an, op an opposing tree at the end of that hallway. Okay, now we're going to go to the other side of the Hudson um, on the east side um, in Columbia County. Completely different uh, landscape for this house. The last house was on 11 acres. Uh, this house is on 8.5 acres. They're both around 2,000 square feet. The last house is a little bit more. Um, this one's a, almost exactly at 2,000 square feet. What drove the design of this house, um, it was uh, corn crops uh, before uh, we put the house on it. We became very interested in these sort of lines and inscriptions in the landscape, kind of got obsessed with these linear patterns um, created by the farming equipment. Uh, so we really decided that we were just going to organize the entire house based on this type of pattern um, and organization. So. Uh, the, uh, you can see in the image on the lower left, the foundation walls, we just kind of stretched the house um, as much as we could along this sort of uh, pattern. Yeah. So here on the left, the, uh, the site plan, you know, we wish that basically a tractor had like plowed the, <laughs> the house. So the idea of it sort of being along those same configurations. Um, and then the, obviously the, on the right, the, the more sort of uh, detailed plan. Um, so basically it became these two linear volumes sliding uh, next to each other. It did one nice thing is it created two patios, what would, the smaller one being the sort of sunset patio uh, facing west and the larger one uh, facing the largest view um, and also the, the south patio with the barbecue. One thing, and we'll talk about a little bit more in a few slides, is basically the, the thinner uh, the box on the right was because we call this a wet zone. It had all the mechanicals, the plumbing, the bathrooms, the kitchen, and then the volume on the left was the dry zone, the living room, dining, and then the bedrooms and the study upstairs. It was a way to be incredibly efficient and you know stay within the budget by really um, creating this very tight zone where we packed all those wet mechanical uh, zone and kept the other part actually quite simple. And we also just did the basement in, in that long kind of thin area. And we'll, we'll show you that when we get to some of the construction photos. So here the, the final uh, built house and playing with the ideas of the landscaping and the retaining walls. Um, this is the view obviously from the longer patio. The materials of the house are a black uh, corrugated aluminum uh, siding and then with aluminum storefront window systems and then on two sides of the house we um, covered the aluminum uh, storefront windows with the uh, polycarbonate panels and then we used that we inverted that relationship for the garage which is a polycarbonate with a black um, one of the other things similar in the way that we were talking about with the last house we're it, very interested in kind of being able to see in and through the house um, so we kind of, uh, we, at both ends of the house, it was totally open. So we had, I don't think we have any images of the steel, but we needed mm -hmm. to, both ends of the house, we needed this sort of steel moment uh, frames in order to achieve these wide openings. But the idea here, this is sort of the back door, but we like the idea that most people don't know what's the front and the back door. But the idea that you would just go straight through the house and right back out was something that we were really interested in. This is looking in and through the, the thinner of the two boxes, so this would be the wet zone. Um, so you're actually looking in and through the, uh, the kitchen. And again, as you go around the house, and then here, uh, creating, the, again, this linear pattern uh, of the aluminum siding. And then we um, inserted just uh, flat bar panels um, where there was the zones of the windows, a sort of comet effect, but really just stretching out, again, stretching out the program of the building, stretching out the house of the building, but then even in the elevation, trying to sort of elongate these windows and having them sort of have these tails that would create, uh, reinforce this idea of the linear in the garage. <laughs> sure. Um, these uh, are a couple of images of the construction um, and speak about what Stella was talking about before in terms of the different sides of the house. We're looking into the formwork of the concrete right now. 
um, the image on the left of uh, the basement space, which uh, was the only ex fully excavated portion. Uh, the uh, the area of the house on the on the right, the larger dry zone and more public spaces, was a slab on grade. Um, so you can begin to see in the bottom image that the the retaining walls sort of stretching out to the landscape. And then uh, with the formwork off. Uh, again, the two distinct zones of the house legible in the foundation, the retaining walls extending out into the landscape, uh, and then the one main retaining wall between these two sliding volumes connecting with uh, the garage. So I'm going to talk very quickly about the interiors, but again, kind of staying on this theme of this, I think you got it, the wet, is that us? Oh, that's my talk. Um, the wet, the wet and dry zone. So here, the interior coming from the entry. Uh, this is sort of this long kitchen counter on the left that I'm going to speak about. Stairs obviously going up to second floor, but then the stairs going down to the basement. So this is the zone of the basement space and the and the entry. Um, this, the I, we really wanted to kind of create this piece, the kitchen, this this uh, floating cabinet piece is that really the centerpiece of the house to keep it not only open in the way that the house sort of functions, um, but really is, is, is kind of a, a, well, just a centerpiece for the house. Um, so, but that was challenging um, to sort of get all the plumbing and the vents and everything to be lifted up uh, higher than your typical uh, four, six inch uh, toe kick that you would do in a typical uh, bathroom configuration. So, yeah, kitchen, this isn't the bathroom. Um, so I wanted to show you this image, this is a, a, a Korean uh, clad uh, kitchen counter. Um, but the way that this worked, and as you can see, the counter sits on the concrete step, but actually there's a hole underneath that where all the plumbing goes down into, and that was how we were able to sort of achieve um, this floating counter, which the plumbers were thought was a little bit weird at first. But this just, you can't see the construction drawing too much, but the images on the right show a series of sections through that uh, kitchen counter, and the last one on the lower right shows how it then sits on top of that hole, and then all the plumbing goes down into the basement at that location. There's essentially like a little uh, chase wall that runs along the whole back of that counter. Um, this is how it was assembled. Actually, the, the, the column that's holding up the whole house in order to maintain the span between both of the two volumes is also holding up the structure for this uh, long counter piece. And then essentially, the counter came in in these three pieces and just were slid on um, like on a, on a rail and then uh, clamped together. And then here you can see the when it's put together and then that's Dave, he's actually standing down in the basement in the newly cut hole in the cabinet where all the plumbing is gonna run down in and through so you kind of get an idea of the, the puzzle in order to achieve the, the, the kitchen that we were looking for. Quickly, some images upstairs, very simple, white palette. We wanted your eye to go outside, again, to the landscape and just sort of frame the landscape. Um, there's a cut in the second floor and with a, uh, a skylight above. There's no air conditioning in this house, but with the two sliding doors on either end and then when the uh, skylight is opened, um, the heat comes, goes right out of the house and it actually works quite well. Um, so, and then basically just the two bedrooms, and you can see through that cut, you actually still have a view to the, uh, to the uh, downstairs living room. Um, these are uh, frosted acrylic steps to the master bedroom and acrylic sliding doors, um, and then some images of that bedroom and the bathroom. Here you see in the lower left-hand corner, the other side of that aluminum storefront window system with the polycarbonate um, at sort of the top and bottom with just the the slice of the, uh, of the windows. And then for instance, in the shower area, again, here, this was our interior interpretation of that sort of, that streaking, that comet. We kind of allowed the void go to go into the sh shower, the shampoo shelf in the same way that we were using the flat bar on the exterior cladding to kind of streak the, uh, the windows to create more of that linear effect. Okay, last, last two quick ones. Mm -hmm. um, okay, these are uh, the last two projects are uh, in process in the office right now. Uh, so these are uh, design drawings. Uh, there will not be any construction drawings yet. Um, this first project of the last two is for um, an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City. Uh, and it is about uh, this sort of overriding concept of the Rococo. Um, and uh, we have done several shows for the museum 
uh, but none this large. Uh, this show is a two-floor exhibition, uh, and there are about 385 individual pieces in the show. Uh, so this idea of the pattern, or the I should say the organization becoming the pattern, becoming the architecture, uh, or the design of this show, uh, is paramount for us uh, in this instance, as well as to a certain extent in the next project. Um, these, uh, this drawing is, uh, is only about three of the 12 or so rooms in the show. Um, and these are all the pieces and the different sizes um, and the beginnings of configurations that the curators have, uh, have or the beginning of the, the pieces that the curators have determined the pieces and we've begun to uh, determine the configuration. Um, this image is, um, it's a graph of all of the different pieces in the show. Um, explaining, uh, assigning a color as per country and a shade uh, as per century. The show sort of touches on four different centuries which are indicated here. Uh, so these are all of the different pieces from the different localities. Um, this band here collapses all of these um, uh, bars of the pieces uh, in time, but the gradation of color ex still explains their, uh, their period of time. And then the bottom bar is the organization of the show in the museum itself, divided as per room of the, of the museum. Um, we did a, a very quick analysis to derive these colors, first colors, uh, then, then assigning uh, colors to countries, looking at pieces uh, from uh, the, the show itself, then looking at pieces uh, and interiors of the, the time, and then the very last one, uh, looking at uh, Sofia Coppola's movie, Marie Antoinette, that was closely at the tail end of the Rococo period. Um, then beginning to um, come up with a, a pedestal uh, and display system. Uh, and we've begun to work with, these, uh, with uh, the simple sonotube, um, which is just a cardboard form. Uh, and then where larger platforms are required, uh, a uh, sort of custom made disc. And uh, we have sort of did a complete analysis of sonotubes, finding that you can get, uh, they run from six inches to 60 inches uh, at about gradations of six inches in between. So the, uh, the possibilities are, are numerous. Uh, this uh, image of the two um, floor plans of the, the show in the, the museum begins to show or shows this configuration of all of the different pieces on their different pedestals. Um, and then the brightly colored graph is in this sort of public and lounge area that is the um, stairwell of the museum. Uh, this, uh, this page is, uh, speaks about the Hall of Mirrors that comes from uh, Versailles, and we are beginning to work with this idea of creating the stairwell of mirrors uh, that also fits into its existing architecture as the mirrors in, in uh, Versailles. Uh, in that hall fit into uh, an existing architecture. It was a renovation. Uh, and then the, the seating area uh, essentially is the graph of the show itself uh, covering the bench, uh, the benches in these colors. And then the very last project um, is um, a project um, on the west side of the Hudson and it's a renovation of a, of a farm building, existing farm building. Um, and uh, in this project, we were very interested in its site. Um, and it was the, the farm sat on the sort of cusp between the edge of the Catskill Mountains and an extremely flat, fertile agricultural plain um, that you can see in these diagrams um, with the Asopus Creek running through. Um, and what we found when we looked at some of the maps uh, was that the, this topographic line, that was essentially the edge between the mountain range and this valley, uh, had you know, a, a, a settlement pattern of buildings that sort of drifted along it. It was a very casual organization along the line. So we're very interested in this idea of drift uh, in terms of settlement pattern, then moving into programmatic organization of the building itself. The image on the right is the site itself with the existing, the five existing buildings including the treehouse um, and the building that we are renovating with the programmatic elements within it. Um, so we, we uh, sort of created a game out of uh, the programmatic boxes 
that we thought we would insert into this existing structure. So the, the rule was don't touch the walls, insert the box. Uh, and you can see the different boxes here carrying different uh, uh, bathroom, kitchen, cooking, and closet functions. Uh, then the sort of catalog of those down below and beginning to place these objects in, uh, in the building. Uh, then in this image, uh, the, the sort of game itself is revealed and that is where um, there was a relationship between programmatic box, window configuration, and uh, views out to the surrounding buildings or landscape. Uh, so if we moved a box, uh, we would move a window uh, and create a different view, uh, a view framed view. Uh, and this is a series of models uh, where we were looking at the, sort of this very, very precise configuration of, of windows throughout the building. Um, and we were also very interested in this idea of keeping the same size window. Uh, there, was, there are severe budget restrictions, so we thought one window size would make things, the detailing, uh, a lot easier. These are images of the, the facades, including the roof and skylights, as well as the plan configuration. Uh, and then uh, 3D rendering views of the exterior, where you can see the, uh, the windows sort of moving around facades. Uh, and then on the inside, uh, the, the programmatic uh, boxes uh, in this view. Uh, the upper view is the kitchen, kitchen counter. Um, all boxes were black, and interiors are a shade of orange. Thank you very much. And we'd be happy to take some, any questions. I mean, it's obviously two principals, um, and we have uh, seven full-time employees right now. Whenever I think about it, I sort of go around the room. Um, and then a, a series of interns as well who uh, come in and, and work with us at various times, especially now we're working on this uh, the monograph. Um, the office is sort of structured, uh, you know, with Stella and I sort of hashing out design, bringing various people into the process. Uh, who are going to be working on the projects. Um, and those range from employees to obviously uh, these engineers um, who we, we work with who, uh, and other consultants as well, mechanical engineers, uh, landscape uh, consultants. We actually also used a, um, on the mixed screens project, it was the one time that we, the budget afforded us to work with a lighting <laughs> designer. Um, and she was very, very helpful in helping us make sure that we didn't get hot spots in that kind of glowing ceiling. It was really important for us to have that sort of even glow. Um, a lot of the other project we would love to work with lighting designers, but sometimes our budget doesn't allow for it. So we end up doing a lot in our office. We started our practice building furniture and we, we were speaking with the uh, women in design group this morning and talking a lot about doing a lot of fabrication in the office. So there's a, we, we call it Love and Studio because it, it's still very much functioning like a studio. And when we have to build things and do mock-ups, we're doing it in the office. I mean, for better or worse, we don't have a, a shop. Um, we have our practice in Manhattan, and we have a pretty small office for the amount of people that are in there, and it's uh, it's cozy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you can imagine what this week was like uh, putting the show together. Yeah. <laughs> Everything gets cleared off the conference table, and the mylar gets rolled out, and aluminum is cut and drilled, and so, yeah. It's, it's messy. It's, yeah, it's yeah. wild. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, as Stella said, as we began making furniture um, and we were constructing the furniture in our office, uh, <laughs> uh, 
um, we were used to sort of aluminum shavings flying onto the computers and things like that. But we also, um, we were very involved in the details. Uh, and that's helped us to obviously do some, some of the work ourselves, uh, as you saw me in the hole on that one house. Um, but as well uh, as uh, understanding and, and um, you know, caring about an attention to the detail. Uh, and that kind of involvement with the construction, I, I think oftentimes it works, it might even work better to not build it. <laughs> Having had the, the, the experience is wonderful, but uh, it allows you to sort of move through details and um, understand uh, the people who will be building it um, very, very well. And that's one of the things I think that's very valuable to us so that when we do get involved, we learn an enormous amount. Uh, but then when we're not, we're able to, we feel that we've got some confidence or you know, gaining that confidence to, uh, to you know, work through a series of details. But, but we have been very involved in the details in the past we're, uh, in terms of the actual construction. Uh, the house in Columbia County, we were very involved in the building of that, especially on the interiors. The, the reason we're showing you the cabinet installation, we did that uh, with, with some help. But there was a lot of aspects of that house that we actually built. Um, and that was invaluable. Um, but I think you know we're understanding the, the pros and cons of being that involved and actually doing the work yourself sometimes in some degree has a disadvantage because you're so consumed by the building itself. On the other hand, the experience of actually doing it, we, we know, we know the details, we know how we can push it and how we can work with our contractors and subcontractors because we've, we've built that stuff ourselves. So we, we try and find a balance. We've been doing a little bit less of it recently. Mm -hmm. certain mm. clients um, and we've also sometimes you know ran two sort of presentations in the office um, that are not in conflict with each other but emphasize different things um, so it really it, it, de it depends um, but it's it's not an easy thing um, and I think that you have a better well, one thing you know <laughs> <laughs> no it's not better but if you get the uh, if you get the HVAC right you can get other things done. That's true. If, we, you, if, we all, of your, if all of your beautiful details and your sliding door and this slots in perfectly, um, you know, if that comes off beautifully and it's hot when it's not supposed to be, it, it's a disaster. So we, we, um, we're just all over the, the, the people building it and the engineers, you know, are you sure this is gonna do what it needs to do? So probably the, the answer might be just sort of an obsessive attention uh, to these things. Um, and also, you know, explaining to the client the, the value of these things. Uh, and that changes from job, you know, from job to job and types of job. Uh, there are different concerns with commercial work versus residential work. Uh, so you can explain to somebody that this thing is going to be so spectacular that it's going to bring people into your shop. Whereas, you know, it's a different kind of configuration with a residential project. But you can't always, as we all know, you can't always convince every client to do something that's a little bit more sort of conceptual. To, we've either pushed it or, and, and then at times we've gotten, we were very fortunate. I mean, the, the printing plant, I have to say, you know, it's very unusual for a, a printing company to, they wanted design, they wanted something that they could bring their clients through. I mean, that right there was, you know, the client came to us for that. We were thrilled. I don't, you know, we, there's a lot of printing plants around that area, 26th Street. None of them are doing design work. We knew we had a very, you know, narrow place to do it because they said, yeah, we want design, but we don't want to give up square footage. We don't have a lot of budget. Most of the money's going to the presses. But they were interested, and we were able to really grab onto that as long as we kept them within the sort of budget, which is a lot of how we were also able to get some of the things. We had to be very creative about our materials um, in the past and sort of like, we'll get it. If you give us a design, we'll get you at your budget. And when we've been able to achieve both, then sort of we're all happy. I think there was a question back there. Um, first of all, I, I really like your design, design aesthetic. Um, I'm 
really curious to um, find out how you first different, differentiate what to pattern within a certain um, project mm -hmm. and uh, how you go about this. Um, I understand diagrams are very important, but you sketched um, you photo and you use photography. How, how do you go about that? Yes to everything. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's just, it's subjective, right? I mean, it's it's selective. We, we uh, it's, it's a hard thing to sort of say that there's a process that I could define. I don't know if you could. I mean, it, like each project sort of we take on the side in the program and it's really a kind of long process of discussion and what emerges and what's the thing that we care about, what's the thing that we're interested in, what's the thing that keeps showing up on the photos. You know, sometimes we don't even realize that we get back to the office and realize that we've been photographing the same thing. Like, it must mean something to us. But, you know, let's do something. But also, you know, I think also what you're getting at is uh, this idea of observation mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, continuing to look and to, you know, sometimes we t think of it as grazing, you know, uh, and, it, and it changes from scales of projects, uh, urban design projects that we've done, you know, we just sort of obsessively look around um, aerial photography uh, and then begin to use, you know, other, you know, certain methods of, you know, sketching on top to pull out patterns um, using Photoshop to play with um, uh, contrast, see what sort of recedes, what comes forward. Uh, so these patterns, they sort of, they emerge, they're emerging faster, um, but they, they take some time to emerge and, it, and it's really an activity, whatever it is, you know, that you apply to it, whether it's photography or digital media, uh, you know, it sort of starts to, to come up in the project and then we, then we begin to, you know, apply program um, or sometimes this pattern can come out of program, uh, like in this uh, the exhibition. You know, the pattern is made from assigning simply a bar to each piece, and then you know assigning color based on another thing. So I guess it's you know in that project it's sort of like a series of factors that we're assigning values to, and then we you know start to see where we can apply it uh, and see where it you know applies itself, makes sense, etc. Okay, other, uh, other questions, both personally during the reception of 